and there is a webcast link. Now, I don't need to send him that. He can just... My TA, when he logs in, should be able to automatically see this. That's the theory. Now, that was concerning that your students weren't automatically seeing your... It's a very big class. It may have just been a late ads who had, you know, there's, there's 600 of them. Yeah, that's, so. that's a decent amount. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Two sections. It may have even been students from the other section who wanted to see it. And I, they, I, they are obviously on my blackboard. I'll sort that out with you. It's really not a big deal. Ooh, that's, okay, that's spiking up to red. Let's just get a little further. Is that the game? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we'll do that just so that's a little better. I just don't want it hitting red and all the time. Okay, so now that's capturing this, and if I pulled up slides, it would do that as the secondary and the video of me as the as the little inset. So what do I do to switch so inputs? So when we hit to Air Media, we'll lose the preview here, but this Aver capture will switch to that input. Does that make sense? Well, let's. Can we pull it up on my laptop? Sort of very circular, but. Oh, I see. Yeah, that might get dangerous, but let's try it. <laughs> So, where does it show up in here? Do you know under the course? Uh, it's actually under um, web, if you go to webcast. .ca, it'll be the live one. And then um, yeah, there it is. And it's delayed by about forty seconds to a minute. Really? Yes. Okay. Yeah, because we're we're still moving. There's the switch. There, now it's showing that thing. But black oh, there it is. Okay. Okay, so that's the Air Media. And so then I just need to... I'll just launch that again. That's because you lost Wi-Fi, is that right? Yeah, yeah I, I changed my password quickly so that I knew what it was. Fair enough. I used this really secure password, and then I could not remember all the little subtleties of it. So I've been pulling it up on my phone. Oh, what am I doing? Sorry. I'm watching my lecture again. Need the new air media. The code right now is. Thank you. Oh, there it is. Okay, okay so that's the. Because um, you're playing back, right? That's, that's the, the cycle. From your website. Yeah. Yep. I just turned that down. Yeah. Just give it a few seconds so to make yeah, sure. 40 seconds from now, we should see your actual laptop there. Yeah, because I mean that's what we can see. Right. Yeah. So that's what. So we that's can see there. that's actually what we will see in forty seconds. Could be. Yeah. So if I, I don't need to be watching this well, anymore, let's, let's right? Keep it open just to make sure. Right. So once we see. Yeah, your I'm just going to try and mute this tab so that oh, I don't. There. there. It is. Perfect. So you can see it. Yep. Great. And so then I pull this up, and yeah, once I go see. full screen. Okay. And is this this is the delayed version as well still? Is that right? No, you hit, you hit pause, it looks like. Oh, I have. Okay. That was just the noise. Thank you. Zoom. Is he? There we go. Um, but now let's close your, let's just close that whole tab so it doesn't get confused. There yep. we go. All right, so, in, so that's actually not too bad. Yeah. So, so in general, all I have to do is launch Panopto, switch the input here, which actually changes the input to the Aver Media, yeah. and then make just do my laptop. In Panopto, make sure webcast is selected, yep. and that Aver Media thing is up. That's, that, that, that's fine. Go. I'll, I'll get Ian to swing by, or one of you to swing by next sure. week, just to watch just me to do it sure. in case, yeah. okay. and then I should be good for the rest of the semester and for the future. Sounds good. Do you have any videos or anything you're playing? Or can I just say uh, I won't be playing any videos. I just need the mic. Perfect. Everything is all just static. Okay. Sounds good. Cool. Thanks, okay. guys. Okay. okay. All right. You all calm down very quickly there. See that okay?
Okay, can everyone hear me all right? We're using the microphone today to help with the overflow room, which apparently had some weird feedback last week from that microphone. So I'm wearing the, this mic. Okay, I think we're good. Let's get started. This will be how the lectures will run for the future. Last week was just an aberration because they couldn't get the tech working in time because nobody warned them that it was supposed to happen. I called them 20 minutes before the lecture to be, oh, so somebody's coming over to help me set it. They're like, what are you talking about? Apparently, somewhere between the registrar's office and the scheduling folks and IT, there was a drop communication. And nobody let them know that we had an overflow room or that we needed help in any way. So it got a little messy. So welcome back. This is lecture two. I posted the slides a little late. I do apologize for that. I'll try and get them up a bit faster next week so that you have them ahead of time in case you want to print or whatever makes you happy. I see a lot of laptops. That's totally fine. Um, it's a two-hour lecture, too, so it lets you take a bit of a break and do whatever it is you do on the internet during your break. This is lecture two of 12. We are continuing in chapter one. We will wrap up chapter one today, and that will set us up to do cha start chapter two next week. And that's where we really start to get into the meat of statistics, and we actually start to do computations based on statistics. So these first two weeks are a lot of definitions, a lot of vocab putting us all on the same page, making sure we all kind of speak the same language. And then next week, we actually start statistical testing, which is the purpose of the course and why you're actually here. So last day, we didn't quite finish experiments. We ran out of a bit of time because we started late into the lecture. So I'm just going to recap that, finish up that little topic, which is chapter 1.5 in your text, and then move on to 1.6, which is data analysis. Now, a couple of announcements just to kind of set the stage and make sure everybody's on the same page. The second assignment has been posted. It is due Friday, as the last one will. That's essentially the pattern we will follow for the entire semester. Uh, we have no midterm, so there'll be no midterm break for us. We'll just keep on trucking. So each week, there'll be a quiz and an assignment and a quiz and an assignment. And with the exception of a Thanksgiving in there and a midterm break in there, we'll just keep going. And that's essentially the entire semester and how it'll go. Uh, we still are trying to figure out exactly what we're going to do with Thanksgiving Monday. And, uh, and the people who are supposed to write their quiz on Thanksgiving Monday will sort something out. We're not 100% sure what's happening there. Uh, but there is no midterm, so there's no break from those. It'll just be a weekly assignment. And again, a reminder, your lowest assignment and your lowest quiz are dropped. So your top 9 of 10 or 10 of 11 or whatever it is in the end are counted and the, the lowest one drops. So if you joined the course late, that's great. You've got the buy. It just takes care of that one that you missed. You don't have to worry about it. Just get caught up before you get any further behind. Uh, anything else I need to announce? Let me think. I'm starting to get a lot of emails again. Please use Slack. It's what it's there for. If it's an email about something inane, I'm going to start sending back an auto reply that says I will get to this in the next two weeks. If you wanted a fast response, you should have asked me on Slack. And that will reinforce the concept to those who can't learn the lesson. All right, experiments, chapter 1.5, principles of experimental design. So experimental design is actually an entire topic. It's, it's an entire course that you can run. And it's often part of a statistics major. It's actually one of the most important ideas in statistics. And it is essentially the concept of designing experiments. And you say, well, what do you have to design? You just kind of do the experiment. Well, that, that's only true when you're doing something like Hooke's Law in high school physics, where it's a spring and a mass, and the experimental controls consist of not bumping the mass while you're trying to measure the extension of the spring. But when you get to real experiments, especially about scientific topics that we don't know the answer to a priori, it becomes increasingly important that you actually set up your experiment in a way which ensures that the statistics that you compute actually mean something and give you results that are scientifically stable and lead to the promotion of more knowledge. So any study where a researcher assigns treatments to cases, or as we sort of summarized it last week, if the researcher interferes in any way with the actual patients or subjects or cases, then it is considered to be an experiment. If the researcher is completely removed and all you're looking at is after the event results, that's called an observational study and it's not an experiment. They're, they're different. So if we assign these treatments, which is to say we split the people or the cases or the rabbits or the rats or whatever we're dealing with into separate cases using randomization as a process, then it is called, and not a terribly original way, a randomized 
experiment because we used randomization. They have four principles that we went through last day where you're just reviewing these quickly. Number one is the idea of control, which is controlling for the difference between the groups. So the example that I used last day, and I'll say it again, if you have a drug trial and you split people into the people who get the drug and the people who get the placebo, then there are other things that can influence the way that the human body does uptake of medication, how far after a meal or before a meal you take the medication, and in addition, how much water or liquid you ingest at the same time as the pill. It can affect the way the pill breaks down. It can affect the way the stomach acids attack it. It can affect the uptake of the drug, and you want to control for that. You want to prevent that from biasing or changing the results. So one thing you could do is to say, everybody, placebo or control, doesn't matter. When you take the pill that we give you, please take it with a single full glass of water. And so you get that much liquid into the stomach at the same time for every single person, which helps control for those differences in drug uptake. Principle number two is the idea of randomization, which I've already mentioned, a randomized experiment, which is that you randomize the patients into treatment groups using a process which is outside the researcher's control. If you divide them on some sort of basis where you're trusting a human to make this decision, it will not go well for you. And last day, I asked you all to pick a number between 1 and 20, and then out of a room of almost 300 people, or well, 260 odd people, zero people had chosen number one. That's not very random. And so don't trust yourself. Don't trust your ability to divide categories randomly. Allow some sort of truly random process to govern this. Flip coins, roll dice, use a computer, use a random number generator, use something which is actually at least quasi-random. Number three is the idea of replication, which is the singular form, there's an old joke that says that the singular form of data is anecdote, which is to say, if you have lots of data, the singular form of it, the one version of it, is when you just tell a story about something that happened to you or somebody you know, an anecdote. Uh, that's not really data, right, because it's a single case, and you need replication. You need more than one case, more than a few cases, in order to truly be able to explain the effects of an explanatory variable on a response variable. If I took five of you and I gave you a pill that I've developed, which I claim will make your hair beautiful and lustrous, even if all five people have that effect, I don't have enough data there to truly be able to say that I can generalize that to the entire population of people with hair or whatever population you're trying to do. So the idea of replication within a study is simply making sure the study is big enough that when you get the results, you can estimate them accurately and you can actually see true effects. In general, the concept of replication in science is to repeat the study entirely with separate researchers, separate cases, separate patients, separate geographic location. All you keep constant is the experimental protocol, which is how do we give this stuff to the people? What is the stuff we are giving to them? When do we give it to them? You know, the, the five W's, right? That part is kept constant, but the who, one of the fives, does change. You use new patients in a new location with preferably absolutely no contact between the original experimenters and the new experimenters, except the write-up of the formal experimental protocol. If you do that, that's even more of that's like a platinum standard versus a gold standard of experiments, where if you can run a double-blind clinical trial that's considered to be the gold standard in biomedical research. If you run two of those in two separate locations with two separate groups and two separate sets of patients, that's even better. And in a lot of fields, they are running into what's called the replication crisis. Um, you're a little too young to sort of realize this, but science changed a lot in essentially the 10 years before you were born and the 10 years after you were born. That kind of 20 year period, things changed a lot because computers became more than just commonplace. They became embedded in every facet of our society. And you're, you're often called the smartphone generation because you were all less than 10 years old, or all the first years anyway, were less than 10 years old when the iPhone was released. And so you grew up with smartphones being a thing. But if you go back a couple more generations, that was not a thing. And in fact, computers 
weren't all that common. Not everybody had a computer, not just one computer, in their house when I was in primary school. There were families who just didn't have a computer at home, and that was very normal. In fact, I was one of the very first people in my community to get internet at home. That's how sort of rare it was in the mid-90s. And so things changed in society, but that also meant it changed in science. And so all of a sudden, you had all these fields who had done very basic statistics before this, having access to computers with all of their power. And out of that came a huge surge of scientific research. And unfortunately, as we are discovering now, maybe it was a bit too optimistic. And a lot of these studies aren't being replicated. What that means is people take these papers that have been published in very, very high quality journals by very good researchers, and they try and replicate the effect and they discover that, in fact, they cannot observe the same effect again, which means it was just chance. And we'll talk a lot more about that next week as we start to actually develop our own analyses for trials. So that's the concept of replication. Concept number four is the concept of blocking, which we're not going to spend a lot of time on in this course, but I didn't mention it last time, and I'll say it again. The idea is if you know or suspect that there's something else that will strongly influence the response variable, which is a characteristic of your study population, then you can block for it. And you essentially break the population into groups based on this other variable. And then from within those groups, you randomize 50-50 into the treatment and to the control. And so the classic example is heart attacks. And obviously, if you're researching some sort of new heart attack drug or drug that's supposed to reduce cholesterol or in some way impact heart attacks, you obviously know that there are a subpopulation of our society who is more prone to heart attacks. If you have a genetic history, of, you know, a family history of heart disease, if you are extremely overweight, if you have an unhealthy lifestyle, if you're a smoker, all of these things are known to be very highly associated with an increased risk of heart disease and heart attacks. So what you do is you take your population and you split it into people that you think are high risk, that have some sort of genetic predisposition or lifestyle for heart attacks, you put them in one group, and then the rest of the people. And then from within those groups, you take each group and you 50-50 randomize them into, here, you get the drug, you get the placebo, you get the drug, you get the placebo. And what that will allow us to do is say, if we end up with an effect on one side, we don't know that it is due to that blocked variable. There's a little more information on the blocking in the textbook if you are curious. We're not going to do a lot with it. It's an idea you should be aware of. And if you ever are involved in a clinical trial, it's a very important process. But it does get very complicated. And so we're not going to go too deep into it. This practice problem we did last time, this was the way we ended the lecture. And so of these, which of the following was correct? So we say light and noise might. OK, one sec. Why are you being dumb? Alrighty. The Air Media, which is the thing that connects the laptop to the projector, just rebooted. Okay, we are back. Better than ever. Sorry, where were we? So this was the thing we concluded the lecture with last time. So light and noise might have different effects on males and females. So wants to make sure that both genders are equally represented within each group. 
equal representation, that idea. So the light and the noise with the effect are clearly explanatory variables. And we're trying to determine the exam performance. And so that is the response variable. So this other thing where he says, the researcher says, they want to make sure that both of the genders are equally represented. That's the idea of, OK, you're trying to make sure that the male subjects are equally represented 50-50 into the control and the trial. And similarly, so that's a blocking variable. And so that led us to two explanatory variables, light and noise, check, one blocking for gender, check, and one response variable for exam performance. So is that what we should do for exams? Like, search for everything and So th this is something that has very little to do with stats. It's just a general kind of studying technique. Yes. Word problems are very much a part of your life from this point on. And parsing of word problems and dealing with the English of it is very much something you can do. And yeah, it, you know, to bring highlighters. Seriously? OK. Uh, bring highlighters with you to an exam. Bring pens. And you can kind of go, OK, this is saying this, and this is saying this. And those are different. So what does that mean for my problem? Yeah, it just rebooted again. OK. Well, if it's going to be a pain, I will break from it for today, and I will ask IT to fix it. Although I will very much miss having my pen. I like writing on the slides. All right. All right, so this is where we were. And yeah, that's the, uh, that's the setup. So then the difference between a blocking and an explanatory variable. So when we say a factor in statistics, a factor is something we impose on the experimental units. That can be the patients, subjects, the little white rats, whatever we're dealing with in our particular study. Blocking variables are these things that you come with, the patients come with, but we want to control for these. They're not really of interest to us. We just know that they exist. And it's like the concept of stratification and sampling, which we'll talk a lot more about in the coming weeks. Uh, a few more words. A placebo is a fake treatment. That one sort of made its way out into society. Most people know about the placebo effect and have heard of placebos before. Uh, blinding. That's when the patients or the subjects of the trial or the study do not know which group they're in, which is that's sort of the bare standard of what you should do because people have the ability through weird stuff we don't understand in your brains to influence the results of medication. If you think you're being given a medication, you automatically get better, even if the medication does nothing. It's called a psychosomatic effect. It's just our brains are weird, and you need to control for that. So you can't let people know whether or not they are actually being given the true drug. And a double blind is when the researchers, the people giving you the medications, have no idea what drug or placebo you're being given. Now, you have to be very, very careful. I have a, I have a colleague who works for 
the Paramedics Association of Peterborough County. So he's a paramedic, and he does some research there. And they were running a clinical trial using the paramedics where they gave them a different type of uh, drug that they would hang in, a, in an IV bag when they arrived at the scene of certain types of things, which was supposed to test to see if this thing was better than the default. Problem is they packaged it differently, and it didn't weigh the same. These are paramedics. They do this every day. They knew exactly what they were giving to the patients, and they, they knew exactly what, which one they had in their hands because they didn't ensure that the two packages were identical and that the weights were identical. People notice this stuff. If you know, your friend is given the drug and you're given the drug and yours feels awfully light compared to your friend's, that's probably a sign you have the sugar pill. People will notice this kind of thing, and so you need to be very careful when setting up the blinding to actually do it in a very sort of paranoid way to make sure that, in fact, the patient and, in fact, the researcher are blinded to what you are actually handing out. And this is the best way to do it because if you're not double blinded, people have this bad habit as researchers of uh, subconsciously passing on information. You, know, you use different wording and different layout and you can actually pass information without even realizing you're doing it. So that's why the gold standard in biomedical research is the double blind clinical trial. So here is one more question for you. This sort of wraps up 1.5. What is the difference between an observational study and an experiment? These are your four options. Number one, uh, experiments take place in a lab. Number two, in an observational study, we only look at the past. Number three, uh, experiments use random assignment. Observational do not. And number four, observational studies are completely useless because you can't base causal inference on them. So. Uh, number one is obviously false. You can do an experiment wherever you want. You can do it in the, in the rainforest of the Congo or in a lab in downtown Brooklyn. It doesn't really matter where you are. Number two is actually referencing something else that we defined on the first day. That is not an observational study. That's a retrospective where we're looking back at the past. It is a thing, but it doesn't apply to all observational studies. And number four, if that were true, 90% of science becomes bunk overnight. So let's hope that one's not true. So that leaves number three, that in fact, the big difference, the key difference between an experiment and an observational study is the use of random assignment. So this is a little chart to kind of give you an idea of where you live. If you're able to use truly random sampling and random assignment, then you get an ideal experiment. These are very, very hard to do. And in fact, most of the time we cannot do them due to ethical concerns because it's hard to actually do random assignment. You can imagine a case where we do random sampling, sure, from a population, but then if we then take those randomly sampled people and half of them get something good and half of them get something controlly, then the ethics say, you know, you may be doing something wrong and it gets hard to get it past your review boards. The generalizability thing is what we do sometimes. That's an observational study. We get the random sampling, but there's no random assignment at all. In that case, you get no causal conclusion. You get a correlation. That correlation is generalizable, but it doesn't actually give you any causality. You can't say A causes B if you don't have random assignment. If you've got the random assignment, but you don't random sample, then you get a causal conclusion for sure, but you don't get to generalize it. You can't say the whole population. At the end, you say, well, it worked for this particular population that we sampled, and that's it. And then finally, in the... Uh, <laughs> In the bottom right is an area of particularly bad observational studies where not only do you not have random sampling, but you don't have random assignment, and you're just waving your hands vigorously in the hopes of flying. And it's not very good. So that's the general case. Pretty much all of science falls into one of these four categories. All right, 1.6. This moves us on to genuinely new material, and this is the content of today's lecture, and that's numerical data. And at the end, actually, we'll talk a little bit about categorical data. So this is a lot of stuff where if you took a lab course at any point in your life, that could be year 12 bio, year 12 chem, year 12 physics, if you have in any way ever used Excel to make pretty pictures, then you've seen some of this before. And if you haven't, well, then welcome to data presentation, data visualization. A scatter plot is a useful thing for visualizing relationships between two variables. If you have more than two variables, it becomes very difficult to use scatter plots effectively. There are ways to kind of hack it, but really it's designed for two variables. And you put one on x and one on y, and you look for relationships between all the dots. So here's an example that I pulled from the World Atlas, which is this online interactive thing that pulls from all of the, the sort of global censuses that have been run. And it shows 
the number of children born per woman in a given country versus the life expectancy of that country in years and the size of the dots represent the population of that particular country that's being done. And this is for the year 2011, which shows up in the big background. And so what do we see between these sets of dots? The more you raise Y, what happens to X? X goes down. Or conversely, the more women or sorry, the more children born to each woman on average in this country, the lower the life expectancy is. Now, is this a causal relationship? Well, not that way, anyway. You know, if every woman in Canada decided to have five children, would we all just become really sick and die earlier? The causality runs the other way. And this is actually sort of a proven thing. It's known as sort of the westernization of, uh, of society. It's essentially the longer you live and the more healthier you are corresponds. It, it itself is not directly responsible, but it corresponds to increased average income because you have a nice healthcare system. And typically corresponds to increases in female education. And that's the correlation that actually seems to be the most true, which is that the more educated the women in a country are, the less babies they have. And that's just true across all of Western Europe, across North America, across areas of South America. It's starting to kick in. They're seeing it kick in in Africa now because they're finally education is, is penetrating there enough that you have people who are genuinely going to high school. Women are going to high school and the number of babies they have goes down on about a 20 year lag because they are given options. They have choices in their lives. They're not just married. They actually, they get careers and they get jobs and they choose to balance their life with children. And so that's what we're seeing here. We're seeing what's called a negative correlation because the higher you go in X, the lower you get in Y. And the lower you go in X, the higher you get in Y. So the relationship is that it's a linear, it's approximately a straight line, negatively associated relationship as fertility increases life expectancy decreases. And the relationship did change over the years, but that's hard to show um, without seeing all of the plots. And actually, you can see this relationship changing basically with the, uh, the push of female education across the globe. That's, that site, actually, I'll put a link up to that on, uh, on Blackboard and Slack. It's worth poking around at. It's actually very interesting, especially if you're at all interested in ge geography or demographics in any way. There's some really cool stuff that you can get out of those plots just by poking at them. All right, this is called a dot plot. I'm just introducing plots today. We are gonna learn to create these plots actually in the workshops starting around week five or week six. And you're gonna actually start learning to do data visualization from within R. But for now, we're just gonna introduce the ideas of this called a dot plot. It's only really useful if you have one variable to deal with. As you can see, because you only really have one axis and you just kind of put the dots wherever they appear on the GPA distribution and you let them overlap each other and as they overlap they get darker because they're slightly transparent and so you can see clustering by where it gets very very dark so what would you say about the distribution of where these dots appear in this dot plot so you could say something about where the middle is you could say something about where it appears to be more dense the shape you could say something about the spread. What do you mean by four points? There's about 50 points. No, I'm saying like there's 2.5, 3.0, 3.5, and 4.0, but then there's no middle point. So this is just an axis. It's just a scale. It is continuous in there. It's not like your GPA can only be 2.5, 3, 3.5, or 4 as you will all no doubt discover after Christmas, your GPA can be somewhere in there, but it isn't right bang on one of those things. So that's just a scale. It's like the scale on a map where it says 200 miles. It's not like you take 200 mile steps. It's, it's actually just, that's how long 200 is and you can figure out all the rest yourself. So in here, yeah, you're right. Like in there, you, you want to use more precision in your scale and that's fine. But what else, what can we say about this? What's the smallest value we see? 
2.6, somewhere in there. That, that dot that's on the far left, it's hard, kind of hard to see because it's just one student who's way down there. And what's the highest? We've got a student who's solidly at 4.0, or maybe actually a couple because it overlaps in a way. And so that's our range. That's from the far left to the far right. We go from 2.6 to 4.0, and that encompasses everybody in this sample. Where's the middle approximately? 3.5, 3.6, somewhere in there. You got to remember the more dots you have, the heavier it is. Think of it, you've all done seesaws on the playground when you were a kid. If you have a big kid on one end and a grade one or on the other, it doesn't really work, right? So when you're doing the center, the idea is to find a point that if you were to set up a little pivot and you were to put a seesaw there and then you were to put all the ball the spaces on the seesaw, that it would balance and it would just stay nice and flat. That's what the center of mass actually is from a physics point of view. And we steal that verbiage when we're talking about the center. So the center is somewhere in there, 3.5, 3.6, somewhere in there. How spread out is it? Well, if the center is at 3.5, the spread which encompasses the majority of the dots is about plus or minus 0.5. If we go up 0.5, we get to the highest possible value. If we go down 0.5, we get almost all the values. And then there's those few little cases way down there on the left. So this is where the actual center is. We weren't too far off, 3.59. And you can mark it, and I've marked it with a little triangle so that it hopefully brings to mind to you this seesaw idea. The amount of people on the right-hand side of that and the amount of people on the left, where people is actually their GPAs, balance. And so the total sum of the GPAs above 3.59 is the same as the total sum of GPAs below 3.59. And so that is called the mean, also known as the average. And it's something I'm sure you've come across in your life. Everybody talks averages all the time. Mathematically, it is a concept. It can be formally defined. And actually, this is section A. So everybody here has successfully completed the second workshop. So you've already figured out how to compute these things. You did it in the workshop. This is the definition of the sample mean, formally. So it says x bar, which is how we say that wording for x with the little bar above its head, x bar. That's called the sample mean. It's the mean, or the average, of all of the samples. So sample mean. And it is take all of the values that you have, add them up, and divide by how many you had. And then that corresponds to the population mean, which is the true underlying unknowable but existing value represented. So for example, remember my thing about how nice Canadians are from the first lecture? All right, let me replace that. How tall are Canadians? We could find out. There's 35 odd million of us, but we could get everybody to come to Toronto and we could all line up and we could have a very accurate sort of scale that would measure your height to within a millimeter. You know, everybody has to flatten their hair for this one. And then we know how tall you are. And next, 35 million later, we could actually determine how tall Canadians are. That would be the population me, the average height of the entire population you're interested in. So the sample is the average of just the sample. The population mean is the average of the entire population. And obviously, we don't want 35 million people to come to Toronto. Traffic's bad enough as it is. So we don't do that, but we could. That is theoretically possible. So we denote, so the way we write down population mean is we use Greek letter, and we use the Greek letter mu, which means m in Greek, which is mean, m for mean. So the Greek letter mu means, in this course, always population mean. Now, we don't know what it's the mean of. It could be the mean weight. It could be the mean height. It could be the mean hair color. It could be the mean politeness, if you wanted, if we could find a scale that worked. But it is the average value for every single member of that population. So uh, the sample mean is a sample statistic. We say it is a point estimate. We are estimating the average by using the sample. And so if you have, go back to sort of your sampling from last week, if you have a random sample taken from Canadians, 
and you measured their heights, that would generalize to the population mean height. Now, how well it would do, that's the concept that we'll get to next week. And we'll talk about how good that estimate actually would be. You could do this with a calculator. And by all means, if you want to practice doing some of your homework with the calculator, go right ahead. But everything in this course is designed to be done in R. This is how you would compute the mean in R. You end up with an x, which from your workshops you know is a vector. It has 10 elements. I'll talk more about this sample notation in a minute. And then we take the mean of it. We say mean of x. And it tells us 51.6. That's the sample mean. So if you are given data, and on this homework you have been given data, take those points, put them into R. You now have the vector. Take the mean of those points. That's the mean. That's all you have to do. It takes care of all the little details for you. So this, uh, this sample here is actually something we're going to use a lot. It's going to be used every day that we have a lecture and every workshop from this point on. And it is a random sample. And the inputs to this function, and, and next workshop you're going to actually spend about half the workshop working with this guy to figure out how he works, is what do you want to take the sample from and how many samples do you want to take? So this says, and hopefully you're getting to the point now where maybe you can almost read it as our code, you say, I'm sampling from the numbers from 1 to 100. I want 10 of them, and I'm sampling without replacement. Replacement is false. So how many people here, just a quick check, if you didn't take grade 12 data structures, you probably don't know this, sampling with and without replacement, how many people know the difference? Only a couple. That's fine. It's something we're going to do a lot. So the idea is this. If I have a big bag of numbers, and I reach into that big bag, and I pull out a number, and I go, 56, and I write it down. What do I then do with the 56? Do I put it back into the bag so that I could potentially pull it out again? That's called with replacement. Or, because I replaced it, or do I throw it out? That's called without replacement. And that's the only difference. It's a question of whether you can get the same value twice or more in your sample. Do you put it back into the bag? Or do you just keep it out? And once it's out, it's out. Question. Uh, the 10 is how many? Yeah. So I've sampled from 1 to 100. So it's basically like, remember I asked you all to pick a random number from 1 to 20? This is me picking 10 random numbers from 1 to 100. And so the numbers of you know, 12, 36, 47, 48, 49, just because it's random, 57, 63, it's just 10 random numbers from 1 to 100 that I can then use to just take the mean, just to kind of check and see what it is. What is, so a quick check, let's see how well you're understanding this idea. What is the true population mean that this thing would be the sample statistic for? What's the population first? Population is 1 to 100. So what is the true population mean of 1 to 100? What do you think? Right, so you could actually compute it. You could take mean of all of the numbers from 1 to 100. And does anybody know what that is? How many numbers are there there? 100 numbers, right? And so the average of those is actually 50 and a half. That's the average of the numbers from 1 to 100. So our sample statistic, our guess about what the average of the numbers from 1 to 100 is was 51.6 using a 10 element random sample, and we estimated that. Is that an efficient way to do that? Of course not. Just take the average of 1 to 100. But if I had 36 million numbers, then you start to go, well, maybe it might be a little faster for me to just do a sample statistic. So try and tie these concepts together as we're going through. Ask yourself questions about what I'm doing. Stop me. Be it, make this class a little more interactive, and stop me and ask questions about what you don't understand. Yes, although there is a subtlety there. You can think of this. Imagine I had a big bag of numbers that only has 10 numbers. And I'm going to sample without replacement. So I'm not going to put it back in. I reach in, I grab a number, I pull it out, I save it. What's the probability of getting any one of the remaining ones? It's 1 over 9 now. 
So there's actually some subtleties there about figuring out how to do this so that every single element has the same probability of being chosen. And what you actually do inside this one is if you do it without replacement, it does it over and over again. And if it gets a duplicate, it throws it out rather than making a smaller set, which each element has a slightly higher probability of being chosen from then. You have to be really careful with that. So it, what it does here is it just it samples with replacement over and over again and throws out the duplicates and just keeps going until it gets 10 of them. So that's just that's back end. That's what's happening behind the scenes. But next week, especially, we're going to start talking about this. And you've got to build a little bit of intuition from childhoods playing, you know, Milton Bradley games is entirely enough. But you need to kind of know how dice work and how randomness works from rolling dice, just so you can kind of get your head around what we're doing. All right, so that's how you're going to compute. You did that in the workshop. We're going to keep doing this in the workshop. This is another version of the same thing. So on the GPA plot that we did a minute ago, we just had them all stacked in one axis. And that was OK, but it was kind of hard to see how many we had at a given point, because it got darker, but you're like, how much darker did it actually get? This is called a stacked dot plot. So instead of letting them stack on top of each other, we make them stack vertically. Now, I'm not 100% sure exactly why it got all funky here and like started doing random like curves. We're just going to accept that that was how that program did the plot. But this is a lot easier, because this tells us that the people who had the 4.0 GPA, remember, let me go back. See how that's quite a dark blue dot at 4.0? That meant more than one, but we didn't know how many. Now we go over here, and we go, oh, actually, it was about eight people had a 4.0 GPA. All right, now we know a little more information. It's a little more informative. And if you were asked where the middle of this guy was, you'd be less inclined to say 3.5 and, and more inclined to say 3.6. Because it's clear that actually the big hump is between 3.6 and 3.8. But then this long tail here is going to drag it down a little bit. But it's in there somewhere. But it's a little bit more like 3.6 than 3.5, which actually we know it's 3.59. This is called a stacked dot plot. There is another variation of this that I'm sure you've all seen at some point or another, even if it's only in the newspaper, which is where instead of stacking the dots, we just turn them into bars. And that is called a histogram. And so you've seen histograms before, I'm sure, somewhere in your life, even if you've never made one yourself. So a histogram provides a view of the density like the stacked dot plot does, but it does it by saying, OK, all of the things between this point and this point, I'm going to call that category A. And then the next set is category B, and so on. So it discretizes the data. It turns it into chunks. And then it goes, how many were in that chunk? How many were in the next chunk? How many were in the chunk after? So this is just uh, some data on how much time people spend doing extracurriculars. You know, I'm sure there's a couple of you who are already on like three sports teams, just because you're really keen to have a lot of fun at university and you want to do all these things. And then some of you, your idea of extracurriculars is watching TV. Not that there's anything wrong with watching TV. I like watching TV. But the number of hours you spend on extracurriculars with other people is something that looks like this. This is a study that was done. And so you have most people kind of spend like 0 to 10 hours with other people outside of class and so on. You're, you're busy people. You've got homework to do. And then you've got the people to do 10 to 20. And then you've got a few people to do 20 to 30. And then there's like one crazy person who spends 60 hours a week on their extracurriculars. And like, do you sleep? Is, like, is there sleep involved in your life? Because that's, like a, that's more than a full-time job. And you're doing that all with extracurriculars. Get some sleep. So you get a distribution like that. The thing is, that's a representation that came out of our choice of 10-hour blocks. Depending on how you choose your blocks, histograms can tell different stories. They're actually not a great statistical tool because you can lie with them. You can, you can tweak your blocks until it tells the story that you want it to tell by just moving them around a little. So you have to be very careful trusting histograms. Here's an example of what can happen as you change the blocks. So what if I only had two blocks? According to the two blocks, I've got 190 odd people who spend between 0 and 50 hours a week okay, on extracurriculars. And then I've got one or two people who spend between 50 and 100, and those people are crazy. And then I've got the second one, which is the one that I showed you. Then I pull up the third one, which is where I break it into five hour blocks. And then I have the fourth one, where I break it into two hour blocks. 
which of these is most useful for describing the way that people's behavior actually takes place? What do you think? Probably, yes. Because we still have the y value, a full realization of what's going on there. We can count how many people are in each. And what we see here is that actually the hermits don't dominate quite as much as we thought. There's only 20 odd people who barely spend two hours or less a week dealing with extracurriculars. Most people have one hobby, one club, one sport that they play, you know, one intramural thing that they're involved in, and they spend two to four or four to six. So actually that original histogram, which made it seem like there's 150 people all down by the origin, you gotta remember that's zero to 10. 10 hours of extracurriculars is enough. Like that's a, quite a bit of extracurriculars already. So that's saying that 150 people are spread between zero and 10, that's not really very useful. But this last one, that actually breaks it down enough that we're like, okay, we've got, you know, this initial surge, and then there, there seems to be a bit of a drop down then, and it goes down. And then for some reason in this data set, we've got a spike at 14 to 16, and a spike at 18 to 20. And that could be people whose sports teams have that many hours of practice a week, and that's just how it, it spikes up. Because those numbers, we're looking at like 12 people and 15 people, you know, that's the size of uh, like a soccer team would have 18, 20 people in it. So maybe that's what's going on there. So it's hard to tell, but definitely our first glance was a little too chunky to actually tell what's going on. So when you're doing histograms, one of the parameters is how wide do you want your bins to be? And you should always explore that option, but be careful that you, you actually focus on the one that tells the truth, not the story that you've already decided is what belongs. You have to, you have to be careful not to form your hypotheses early. So all of those histograms were absolute magnitudes. Just look again. See the y-axis? It's number of people up to 150. If we change the y-axis, and that's all you do is you change the y-axis and change it so it is percentage instead. So there was about 200 people in that study. So you take it, all of those numbers, and you divide them by 200. And that's the percent of the total people who are in each of those individual bins, then that is called a relative frequency histogram. And that's just an alternative representation. The actual bars and their size and their shape do not change at all, just the y-axis change. And sometimes it's easier to, to sort of tell what's going on from the relative frequency, because you can go, oh, 50% of the people are in these two or three bins. Instead of going 37 people, then there's a total of, and you start counting, it does it all for you. So it's an alternative representation. And when we do show you how to plot these, we'll show you how to do both. And it's just one parameter that switches how the y-axis is labeled. All right, shapes. So the question is, and we've got language to describe this, does the histogram have a single prominent peak, several prominent peaks, or no apparent peaks? So these are unimodal, bimodal, multimodal, and uniform distributions. So you've, you may have heard the phrase bimodal used before. If you don't, you will definitely probably hear it and in reference to the distribution of grades in a course. The ideal, what we all strive for, is a unimodal distribution, a bell curve. You've all heard of bell curves, right? So what we want, ideally, for our grades in a course is for it to look kind of like a unimodal thing. And the big peak in the middle is somewhere in the mid-70s. And you've got students who go all the way up to 100 and students who go all the way down to 40. And it's a nice distribution of their actual ability. And it's a fair examination and all the rest of it. What actually typically happens is you get a bimodal distribution. You get a big mode up in the mid 70s to high, you know high 70s and that's most of the class and then you get this other little peaky thing down at 40. And that's all the students who just don't come to class and don't do any work and then show up for the exam expecting to pull a miracle out of somewhere and pass the class. And so we often get bimodal distributions for the grades for our big classes because in fact there's two different groups of people taking the class. There's the ones who try and the ones who don't. And they have very different grades, as you might imagine. So this first one is a unimodal. You can sort of see a shape like this. Don't focus on one bin. It's the overall shape. 
the imagination is take a piece of spaghetti that's been cooked and just sort of drop it on the top of the histogram, then the results will kind of smooth between the different bins and that will give you your approximate shape. So this first one would give us a big up and then the slow down. This one clearly would give us one peak, then another peak. And then we clearly have three different peaks where the spaghetti would sit. And then finally, we don't really have any peaks at all. It's basically flat. So those are the four different variations of what are called modality or modes in a distribution. We will talk a lot more about this as we go forward. We also have a concept called skewness, which is does it have one side that seems to be really long and tapering away and small, but it just kind of keeps going, and on the other side, nothing's happening. So for example, this first one is what we say is right skewed. It's got this really long, high tail that just kind of keeps going for quite a while. Really small, but it keeps going. So that's called a right skew. It's skewed in the direction of the big, long tail. The left one might have, we might say, a left skew because it kind of just keeps going and seems to be taper, 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 taper. It's unweighted. It's a little bit heavier to the right than the left, and it tapers that way. And then the final one looks to be approximately symmetric. That's the three types of distributions we can have. The ideal is to have a symmetric distribution, but our reality, our world, is very heavily skewed. Uh, it doesn't matter where you're from. Think about house prices, if you would. There's an average house price in the city that you're from. If you're from Toronto, it's around $900,000, somewhere in that ballpark, if you're talking about fully detached homes. And what's the most expensive house you know of in the city or town that you are from? Well, that's out on the tail, the upper tail. And so that is, a, you know, property value is a right skew because you can have houses that are perfectly normally priced, then you can have six and a half million dollar cottages that you're like, that's a cottage? And that's where somebody, you know, goes on the weekend. And you're like, your standards of what a cottage is are somewhat different to mine. And that's a little different. So property value is a high right skew because you get houses that just cost increasing amounts of money because if you have enough money, you can always spend more money on a property. There's always another boathouse or another guest house or another pool or a tennis court or something you can add which will continue increasing the value of that property. And in addition, there's only so much property around and so scarcity comes into play. But property values is a very clear example in our society of a right skew. So are incomes. You know, Canada is a fairly equal society, not perfect, but fairly equal in the global standard. And so a lot of people make a good solid middle class income. And then there are people who make ridiculous amounts of money. And they are up there, somewhere off to the right, and you're like, I will make as much money as you do in a year in my entire career. You know, they, they own corporations, they work on Wall Street or, you know, Bay Street, and they make millions, tens of millions of dollars a year. They are still on the same distribution as you. So you're plop in the middle, you're making sixty-five, seventy thousand dollars a year, you're right in the middle of Canadian. And then there's people making 10 million. And so that distribution goes out that way. It doesn't go to the left because you can't make less money than zero in a year, really, when you deal with income, at least the way CRA evaluates. Now, once you've sort of looked at it and you see how the shape is set up, we go, sometimes there are things that don't seem to belong. They are called outliers because they lie out or outlie from the rest of the distribution. And so if you look at this first one, we've got this histogram and it goes up to 30 and it kind of tapers down nicely and you're like, okay, it's done. And you're like, okay, it's done, okay, it's done, bloop. And there's one little point over there and you're like, that one is a bit weird. That's like the people who do 70 hours a week of extracurriculars. You're like, you are an outlier. You are not part of the normal group of students here at Trent. How do you sleep? And so look for those points and visualizations like these are set up to help us be able to look for outliers because the majority of the time when you're doing a scientific study outliers are something you want to compensate for because most of the time they're not real you know we have this thing where we think of data as somehow magically being true and it's not data comes from somewhere 
Somewhere along the line, if you go back in time with this data, at some point a human was involved. And that human may have transposed two digits, or written it down backwards, or screwed it up some way. And so those values often show up in our data set as outliers. Things like you're, you're measuring the average height of everybody in the room, and I go around, and one of you is assisting me, and I measure, and I say the height in inches, 72 inches, you write it down, 74 inches, you write it down, 69 inches, you write down 96. Just, you know, you have a little brain, brain fart, and out comes 96. And then I get to the end, and I'm analyzing the data, and I'm like, we had somebody in the class who was 96 inches high? Like, that's ridiculous. Who was this person? How did I miss them? And you're like, oh, no. That was not 96. That was 69. Let's fix that. And you, you go in and you fix it. So data visualization is very useful for being able to look for those outlying points. So in this first histogram, that value up at 18 is, is suspect. You look at it, you're like, that's weird, right? Why did it kind of taper down basically to zero? And then, bloop, up comes one value over there. Is that person representative of the overall population? Is that a weird sample? Is that a typo? What is going on? And you, then you actually go look and you try and figure out what's going on. Similarly here, we have what looks like a very nice symmetric distribution centered in the 30s. And then we've got people up at 100 and 110. So what's going on there? Why don't those people follow the same pattern as the rest of the data? Oh, absolutely. Yep. There are many reasons why an outlier could be real. We could actually have someone in here who is 96 inches tall. That's entirely possible. Why they're not in the NBA at the moment, I don't know, but they decided to come to first year stats instead. But it could happen, absolutely. And you can examine it and go, yeah, okay, that's, that's a legitimate point of data. It would be like, does everybody know who Galen Weston is? You've seen his commercials, if nothing else, uh, if you're Canadian. You know, he's currently the CEO of Loblaws, the Loblaws Corporation, which owns you know, like six different supermarket chains. He, he's a multimillionaire. Let's say we, av we measured our average income, and then we included Galen Weston in the sample. And we plot it, and we're like, boop, 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 you know, like we, we're making $10,000 a year because we're students, and we work in the summer, and we've got to have this nice distribution, and then we've got Galen Weston. And you're like, that's an outlier. And it is if what you're trying to do is represent the average income of students at Trent. He does not belong. And question? That would come down to your determination on whether those are outliers or not. So you would look at them and you would try and figure out what they actually are. And if they are legitimate data points that just somehow the data does that, then it would be definitely skewed to the right. If those are outliers and those are false, then the data is symmetric because that's what's actually real. If those are valid points, then it's not symmetric anymore, it's skewed. And it just so happens that we look at this and we see a pattern that makes it look like it's done, but actually that area between 70 and 90, just we just didn't happen to have any data in there, but actually normally we would, and it kind of just blah, 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 out to the right. And so if those are valid points, that's a right skew. Nope. So we try and work around this. It's a very good point. Let's say you do a study. It costs you a tremendous amount of money and time. You finish it. This is basically code for, um, you know, like your master's thesis. And you do all kinds of studies in a bio lab. And you have, like, you know, uh, Petri dishes coming out the yin-yang. And you've done all this work. And then at the end, you've got these four outliers in your data. What we normally do is we try to explain them. And we try and figure out where they came from. And if you're like, oh, those all happened on the day the freezer failed. I'm going to discount those points. That's a valid scientific step to take. If they just are outliers and you're just like, and you just pretend they're not there, that's scientific misconduct. And it's a fine line, right, to determine what you can do with them. And you always try and explain them. You always try and figure out where they came from. Because if you can, then you can incorporate that into your model. And if you can't, then you have trouble. And then, yes, yeah, sometimes you have to throw the study out because you just can't figure out what's going on. Um, so not all of you have taken physics. How many people are familiar, though, with the Millikan oil drop experiment? Okay, well, 10 people. So it all took year 12 physics, presumably, because that's where it's covered. Um, 
So Millikan was an English scientist, a physicist, and he was trying to measure the electrical charge on an electron. They were trying to figure out how much charge there actually was on a single electron. And the way he did it is he took a very precisely measured drop of oil and he charged it. He gave it a polarity. And then he suspended it between magnetic plates and measured the declination. In other words, how much did it weigh, how much force did it exert magnetically from the charge that was on there. And then that should scale to how many electrons are in the drop and so on. And he had a whole experimental protocol. And he measured this and it was, it was, a, it was an amazing experiment. It sort of was one of the foundational 1900s experiments, or early 18, sorry, 19th century experiments in physics. And it was wrong. He was off by about 20%. What's fascinating is that people tried to repeat the experiment and did and published the results for the better part of 40 years in which their results magically matched his, even though it was wrong. Because they would get outliers sitting at the true value and discount them as being too far from the truth. And over and over again, they'd keep the results that were biased low and throw out the results that were true. And that kept sort of doing it. And if you look, there's, um, I've seen a plot that people have done, which is taking all of the published results over the years and kind of doing it with respect to time. And you start with Millikan, and it's like boop, 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 by Millikan, boop. And that paper is where somebody's like, guys, you're all just wrong. This is wrong. This is not what it actually is. Look, when you do it properly and you stop throwing out these outliers, that's the actual true value. And it was like, oh, well, oh. it was kind of embarrassing, but that's how science works. One slow correction at a time. So moral of the story, your outlier may actually be truly interesting scientific data. So don't go throwing it out until you can explain it. Otherwise, you're just affirming the status quo, and that's not what science is all about. All right, here's some shapes just to kind of give you like just a you know sketchy kind of idea. If you have a unimodal, it should, the piece of spaghetti should look kind of like a hump. Two humps, three humps, approximately a flat thing. And then we get a right skew, which is where the piece of spaghetti kind of trails. And a left skew, where it trails to the left. And symmetry, where it looks kind of like it's symmetric. So those are the shapes of distributions that we'll be dealing with in this course. Any other questions? OK. Which of these variables do you expect to be uniformly distributed? So you have four variables there. Which of these do you expect to be uniformly distributed? That means equally distributed, flat. So are the weights of adult females uniformly distributed? That would say there are the same number of adult women on Earth who weigh 10 pounds as who weigh 300 pounds as weigh 200 pounds, as weigh 150 pounds. They're all the same. You have an equal probability of being 10 pounds as 130, as 180, as 300, as 4,000. You're like, no, that doesn't make any sense. And in fact, that's not remotely true. And you know, the weights of adult females, the weights of adult males, they cluster. And we get symmetric bell-shaped distributions. One is out. Salaries of a random sample. We've already talked about this. Do you expect salaries to be flat? No, we get clustering in the middle, and then we get long tails with really, really rich people. OK. House prices. I've already talked about this one, too. Again, you kind of get, it's not uniform. You don't have the same probability of going house shopping and finding a house for 10000 as 300000 as 4 million. Houses cost a chunk in the middle, symmetric, and then with a long, long tail. What about the birthdays of your classmates? Process of elimination, we're done, but yeah. You are no more likely to be born on the 2nd of September than the 5th of September, than the 9th of December, than the 14th of February, and so on. Bar some very special days, everybody's mostly uniformly distributed in birth. There are four days a year where birth rates are higher than normal, and one day a year where birth rates are lower than normal. What's the lower? Anybody know? Yeah. February 29th. Surprisingly, it only has one quarter the normal number of people born on it. I wonder why. Maybe because it only exists one in four years. Similarly, the dates which have specials are 
nine months after Valentine's Day, nine months after Christmas, and nine months after New Year's. Yes, you're adults. Your parents at one point had sex. <laughs> All right, shapes of distributions. Uh, if you want to try something, sketch the expected distributions of these following variables and come up with a concise way to try and explain it to somebody else. So if you want to practice, give this a shot. It's not for points or anything, but you can give it a shot. All right, so are you a typical person? We have seven plus billion people on Earth at this point. Are you average? Well, if we just measure the mean, we really have no way of saying. If I know what the mean is, I can tell what it is, and I can tell what you are or I am. But I can't really talk about how far I am from the mean, how much spread there is in the distribution. And that's the next idea, which is the idea of variance. How much variation is there in the data you've given me? I can measure the center with the mean, but then I don't know how spread out it is. I can have two entirely identical distributions, both centered at 300,000, but if one of them spreads a lot more, they're not the same, and I want to be able to describe that. And that's the idea of the variance. So the variance is the average squared deviation from the mean. That's the formula. It is not a nice formula. If you ever have to compute it for more than four points, stop, get your laptop, load up R, let R do it for you. I don't compute variances by hand. I don't know why you would. Because you have to, in the process, take every data point you have, subtract the mean from that data point, square the result, add up all those results, and then divide by n. That's a lot of work, especially if you're on a calculator. Because you have to compute all the differences, then you have to square all the differences, then you have to add up all those squared differences, and then you finally divide, and you're like, this is tedious. That's why we invented laptops. So if we have hours of sleep per night, this is self-reported data, do you see any problems with that data? This is your average sleep per night. Do you see any problems? Anyone? Yes. Yeah, I'm not sure who these people are, but physiologically, anything less than about three and a half. And within about four or five days, you enter a neural deficit, and within two weeks, you're dead. So yeah, don't skip sleep that much. It's bad for you. It'll kill you. So yeah, zero to two, not happening. Two to three, also not really happening. Anybody who says they only get two hours of sleep a night is either a mother of a newborn, and in which case I have her full sympathy for her, or lying. And then once you get to four, okay, there's some people who only sleep four and a half hours a night. They are abnormal. It's nowhere near as high as that thing says. In fact, um, you've, you've heard people say, oh, I don't need much sleep. I get by on, on much less sleep than other people. I only sleep four or five hours a night. In properly done formal trials, they've discovered that actually that's about one in a thousand people. I'm sure you all know at least three people who claim they don't need very much sleep. They're probably not one in a thousand. So that's also lying. Once you get to six, you're kind of into the middle of human behavior. And in fact, most scientists who study sleep kind of agree that the human body needs somewhere between six and nine hours a night. And that variation is totally normal. And that has to do with how quickly you fall into REM and how long you stay in REM and how long your body needs to actually recover from its day. Yes, 12 hours a night is abnormal. You probably have narcolepsy. You might want to see a doctor. That's a little bit unusual. Not to say that I haven't had some really wonderful sleeps that have lasted for 12 hours when I've just been zonked, but it's not something I do every day. Also, if you sleep 12 hours a day, how do you get anything done? That's like going to bed at like 7 p.m. Like, yeah. So anyway, it's a weird plot, right? But the mean is 6.71. There were 217 people in the sample, and you could compute the variance by going, all right, your hours of sleep minus 6.71 squared, plus your hours of sleep minus 6.71 squared, plus yours, plus yours, plus yours, plus yours, plus yours, plus why am I doing this, plus why, and then eventually you finish. Or, how do we do it the easy way? Uh, we ask R to do it. One line of code, and boom, it's done. 
So I'll come back to this in a second. So that's the variance. You will note unit analysis is important and you know, you're in university now. People will start taking marks off you if you don't put units on the end of problems and if you don't put the right units at the end of the problems, especially in your sciences class, it does matter. The variance is the square of the unit of measurement. So the variance of hours of sleep is in hours squared. And it doesn't have any nice direct interpretation, but that's what it is if you wanted to describe it. So most of the time, that's kind of weird. And we're like, well, that's not terribly useful. So what we do instead is we talk about the standard deviation. Now, the standard deviation is just the variance without the square. It's the square root of the variance. And its unit takes you back to the original data. And so it's more directly useful. So here we have these hours of sleep a night. And this says that in this study of 217 excuse me, 217 students, the average sleep per night was 6.17 hours with a standard deviation of plus or minus 2.03. And we'll talk more about distributional stuff and what that actually means, but there's a general rule of thumb that if you take the mean and you take plus two standard deviations and minus two standard deviations, that's most of your data. And it describes the spread of your data. Now, you might ask, why are we using the squared deviation in the variance? Like, why do we take the differences between the points and the mean and then square that number? If you don't, and the average is 6.17 hours, and this gentleman here gets five hours a night, when I take the difference, I have 5 minus 6.17, which is negative 1.17. And this lady over here gets seven hours a night, and so she is positive 0.83, and so on and so on. So you've got positives and negatives, and then you add them up, and they cancel, which doesn't represent anything. And so we square it because when you square numbers, they all become positive. And so the variance can never be negative because it's a squared quantity. So the smallest possible variance is zero. And for all of the first years in the room, I can think of an easy quantity that at the moment has zero variance for you. Number of semesters completed at Trent. How many of you? Oh, you're all, you're all, oh, you're all first years. OK. How many semesters? Zero. You're in your very first semester. What's the variance of that? Zero. But it's not negative. You can't have negative variance. It's impossible. All right. So let's do it in R. You did this at least uh, sort of a little bit in the workshop this week. But it is the SD command, standard deviation. And it works exactly the same as the mean command. Take some data, say SD of that data, and it just spits out the number that you want. That's it. There's no actual extra work. It computes the mean and takes it away and squares the results and adds them up and divides by n minus 1, and that's that. Now, let's have a small digression and talk about units or you know, precision. So at some point in your life, you probably took a science class, and your professor was like, all right, so you need to not over, be overly precise in your units, not under precise, don't round early. And you've had some sort of discussion about that. That's actually genuinely important. Because when you are measuring things from data, that data has an inherent precision. And sometimes that data is integer. Number of semesters completed at Trent. You can't complete 1.7 semesters at Trent. You either have completed a semester, whether you pass or fail, or you haven't. Those are your two options. So you have one semester, two semester, three semester, eight semester, nine semester, 10 semester, graduate already, 11 semester, 12 semester, and so on. Those are all integers. But when you go and measure the mean of a bunch of people's semesters completed, all of a sudden you're not integer anymore. You're decimal. So the question is, how many decimals are valid? How many decimals are legitimate in your computation? And the general rule of thumb, and we're not going to be too harsh on this, uh, on the web work, some of the things will be measured to within a certain precision, and it's just generally kind of common sense. 
The general rule of thumb is if you compute something from data, you can be one more decimal precise than the original data was. So if you take a bunch of integers and you feed them in and you get the mean, you report your mean to a tenth of a whatever the unit is. So 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, that sort of thing. When you report percentages in this class, unless you have at least 1,000 points, you round them to the nearest percent. And that's one thing that people love to do in the sciences, and I don't understand it, and it's one of my pet peeves, is they report percentages for some sort of thing to two decimals. I'm like, did you have 10,000 samples in order to be able to determine what that percentage was? Oh, you had 97 samples. Why are you reporting your percent accurate to two decimals? You don't have enough data to actually do that. So in general, the rule of thumb is input data, you're allowed to have one more decimal in the output because you're actually doing something to it and it kind of centers you a little bit better. When you're doing percents, for the majority of the stuff that we're going to do in this class, nearest percent only. 72%, not 72.5. All right, another measurement. This is called the median. How many people have heard of the median before? OK. How many people have computed a median before this week? OK, about 10. All right, the median is another way of measuring the middle. And so if you have the mean, the mean is a way of measuring the middle. A median is another way of measuring the middle that doesn't do a computation most of the time. So the mean height in here, what I would have to do is take everybody, measure their height, add them all up, divide by 265, and I'll get the average height. For the median, I want the person who sits in the middle if I ranked you in ascending order. So for all of the people who are under five feet, they all go over here and I rank them all from four foot whatever, all the way up to five foot even, five foot one, five foot two, do, 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 the six footer, six one, six two, starting to run out. I don't know that we have anybody who's six three in the class, and it's basically done. And then I go, how many of you are there? 265. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 100, 120, 130, 140. Two, and I find the middle person in the list of order heights where you're from shortest to tallest. And that middle person is the median. So if I have five samples, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and I have them in ranked ascending order, the middle element, there's five total, two on the left, two on the right, one in the middle, that's the median. So if you have an odd number of samples, the median is trivial. Rank them, order them into ascending order, find the middle, you're done. What if you don't have an odd number of samples? Then when I order you all, and there's 264 of you, I get to the middle and I'm like, 131, 132, 133. Oh, you're in there somewhere. So what you do in that case with an even number of samples is you take those two middle points and you average them. So you would take the 132nd and 133rd person in terms of their height as measured. The average of that is the median of my data. So in this case, I've got 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and I've got 2 on the left, 2 on the right, 2 in the middle, the average of them, the median is then 2.5. Question? What if you're doing an experiment where the numbers are discrete? So if you have like, um, Doesn't matter. Sometimes you end up with units that don't make any sense, but the median isn't actually this is a set theory argument, isn't guaranteed to be a member of the population. It merely is a break point where 50% of the population is below it and 50% of the population is above it. And it doesn't have to be in the population. So that's, it's just commonly understood and that's how it works. So because it's the midpoint and we got 50-50 split, it's also what's known as the 50th percentile, which is where instead of breaking your data in half, you break it into 100, which are per cents, per 100s in Latin, percentages. And so then it's the 50th percent, which means 50% below, 50% above. So a percentile is the smallest value in an ordered list, which is greater than or equal to that 
percent of the list. It doesn't, as per your question, have to actually be in the list. It's just a number which will have that percent less than the number. And so if you want a really simple example where we can divide things really evenly, the 42nd percentile of the ranked list 1 to 100 is 42. Because 42 is greater than or equal to 1 to 42, which is 42% of the total data. Uh, it becomes very complicated to compute when you don't have this. But we have computers, and I'll show you how to do it in just a moment. So we have special names for these. And if you started the assignment, you will probably have seen these questions already. Q1 is the first quartile. That's what the Q stands for, quartile. Again, we're back to our Latin. Percentiles are per 100 aisles. And quartiles are quart aisles. And what does quart mean? Four. So we divide it into fours. And there are other things like deciles and so on. Actually, interesting sort of word. So deciles means to, to divide into tens. How many people have heard the word decimate before? And we know the historical origins of the word decimate? Nobody? OK, you learn something new every day. Decimate was used for Roman legions or just in general people convicted of crimes that basically were offensive to the Roman Empire. To decimate is to line everybody up, go down the line, and every tenth person gets their head cut off. One in ten. Decimate. So you go down, you're like, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Sorry. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And so on. Decimate. Ten. And so when you use the word decimate to refer to a sports team, did they actually kill one in ten of their opponents? Maybe not, but it's become common usage. So quantiles are quarts or four. Deciles are deck or ten. Percentiles are per 100, and so on. And so the 25th percentile is the first quartile. It's the first quarter of the data. And so we call it Q1 for quartile one. The 50% point is quartile 2, or has a special name. It's called the median. And then the 75th is Q3, or the third quartile. And then we have something called the interquartile range, which is the range from the breakpoint at Q1 up to the breakpoint at Q3, which is Q3 minus Q1. It tells you how big that is. And we short form that as IQR, interquartile range. These are all common, re commonly reported numbers for data sets, and this assignment has you practicing creating them. Where did I put the, oh, there it is. Sorry, I skipped right over it. You can compute these manually, so if you have 347 samples, you are more than welcome to sort them into ascending order and to count until you get to the point that is at 25%. Or you can ask R to do it for you. And the function is appropriately named again, and it's called quantile. And so if you take a bunch of data and you give it to quantile, the probs argument for probabilities is the specification of the percentiles you want. And so you can say, I want the 25th percentile, I want the 50th percentile, and I want the 75th percentile. And it will give it back to you and say, here's your 25%, here's your 50, and here's your 75. And then if you wanted the IQR, you take the difference of the two outside numbers. So on your assignment, you have been asked to do that at least twice. Please feel free to use R to do it. That's what it's there for. It's a giant calculator. Use it. On these assignments, anything is fair game as a technique for solving the problems, except for asking your friend to complete it for you. you know, be honest. If you have somebody else do it for you, we're probably not going to catch you, and then you're not going to learn the material, and the exam is not going to be fun. All right. John Tukey was a statistician who worked at Princeton for most of his career and Bell Labs as well. Yes. Yep. Summary function will pull out that as part. Yep. Okay. Same computation. There is a summary function. If you call summary on a set of data in R, it will give you the quantiles as well as some other stuff. And so you can run that, and that, that also sort of meets the same. There's many ways to do things in R. John Tukey invented this, and it's called a box plot. It is a visual representation of what we've just been talking about, plus one extra thing. So we have our Q1, our median, and our Q2. We've computed that from the data. But you kind of don't have a good sense of how far apart those are visually. The box plot is a visual representation of those quantiles. 
the bottom line of the solid box in the middle is Q1. The solid, heavier weight line in the middle of the, of the box is the median. And the top line of the box is Q3. And then these guys that stick out are called whiskers. And they represent multiples of the IQR. And I'll show you that in just a minute. So if you have one of these, and question one on the assignment is one of these, and so is question seven or something like that. There's a couple of these that ask you to interpret them. They're asking you to just go and go, okay, what is Q3 in this picture? Well, it's about 20. What's the median? Somewhere around 16. What is Q1? Maybe 10, maybe 11. If I had a ruler, I could figure it out. And you just kind of figure out what they are, find the answer that's closest, and choose it in the multiple choice. This is the anatomy of one of these guys. So we have quantile one, median, quantile three. Then we have a lower and an upper whisker. And then we have points which don't fit inside any of that. And they get put in individually, and those are called outliers. That's what we consider to be outliers. So what are these whiskers, though? Where do they come from? Well, they are computed as being quantile three up one and a half interquartile ranges and quartile one down one and a half interquartile ranges. So it's the height of the box times one and a half on top of the box and on the bottom of the box. Let's just go back to the previous. So we take the height of the box, multiply it by one and a half, and stack it on top of the box, and height of one and a half, and we stack it on the bottom of the box. Now, why are those not the same? Why are those whiskers not the same distance from the box? That is one definitely correct answer, yes. And if you hit the max range of your data, you stop. Because you know, it's impossible in this case to have negative data, so why would you make your range down there? The other thing is that if you go out one and a half IQRs, and you are beyond the smallest or largest data point in the set, it gets squished back up to the smallest or largest data point in the set, respectively. So what's happening here is you see these points on the left. Those are the number of hours of studying in a given week. And again, I think people are lying. Nobody studies seven hour, 70 hours a week. You can't. You have to sleep in there somewhere. And so we go to the lowest, which is someone sitting, someone being very honest. They're like, I study two hours a week. I'm not a good student, but that's how many hours I study. That's the smallest data point, the one that's on the left at the very bottom. So you bring your whisker down until you either hit 1.5 IQRs or the smallest data point, or as your correct answer said, zero, and then you stop. When you're going up, you do the same thing. You go up until you hit the maximum data point, one and a half times the IQR, or the max allowable in your physical problem, whichever you hit first. And so in our case, we go up, 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 we hit the point around 35, and we have not maxed out, but that was the first one we hit, so we stop at one and a half times the IQR. So that's how you construct one of these if you start from data. And so you could do this. You could create a box plot from a data set by using either the summary function or the quantile function in R, as well as the min max of the data set, that would be enough for you to figure out where everything lives. Because you can find the IQR, you can multiply it by one and a half, and you could draw a picture. So why is it important to look for outliers? We've already talked about this quite a bit today. But again, uh, they represent extreme skew. They can point out things like Galen Weston being in our class and you know, throwing off the money totals. It's not plus 1.5, it's plus 1.5 times the IQR. So it's plus the number that is one and a half times the IQR quantity. So IQR in our case here was 10. And so one and a half times 10 is 15. So we take Q3 plus 15 
and Q1 minus 15, and that's the default position of the whiskers. But then if they're too big because they've gone beyond all of the data, you shrink them back in to the lar largest or smallest data point that's inside there. Make sense? Okay. They can be either way. Um, they're typically done as vertical. It's just that's the way John Tukey did it in his first publication where he talked about inventing them. Um, but you can absolutely do them horizontally if that makes more sense in whatever sort of thing you're doing. And often people will do horizontal ones if they're talking about things that we intuitively as people think of in the x-axis, like distance. GPAs, we could stack them. That kind of makes sense to us. That's fine. But if you're talking about distance, like miles or kilometers, then we kind of intuitively do this with our distances. It's, it's an x-axis kind of thing. And so they'll often do the box plot on the x-axis. But again, that's, that's mostly just a stylistic thing. It's the, exactly the same construction. It's just laid out on a different axis. Good question. All right. So outliers can be bad, and we need to look for them because they can identify extreme skew. You can have weird things. They can identify problems with your data collection, your data entry. And sometimes, and this comes back to your question, they're actually the interesting thing about the data. Everything else is boring and normal and average, and these outliers are genuinely new scientific discoveries. So they are important to examine. Question? Well, you have to define what range means. So there's different definitions for, when, when we say the word range in statistics, it's actually a formal thing like the mean or the max. And formally, the range is usually described as the maximum minus the minimum. And so in that case, yeah, the eight layers are absolutely part of all that. But you can define the IQR. It's an interquartile range. And so that can be your range, in which case it ignores all the outliers because it's just the part of the middle. doesn't have a it doesn't have a formally agreed upon name that we're going to use so it just is it's just binary yes partially and it also gives you a better sense of where the overall spread of the distribution is if you were to plot this data instead in a histogram form those whiskers should encompass the majority of the data it gives you a good sense of where the left and the right are accepting the outliers so again, it's, it's a summary tool. It's not intended to fully represent the data, but it's a quick and dirty, oh, glance at it. And I kind of look at this and I go, OK, almost all the students have between 0 and 40 hours or 0 and 35 hours of study a week. You can, yeah, if you have a bunch of dots coming out one side of your box and whisker, but not the other, that's your skew right there, absolutely. And yes, the skew on the study of hours per week goes up to 70. Um, what would be the theoretical max of this? Anybody? Theoretical max, what is the Y unit? Number of hours of study per week. What's the theoretical maximum? Hours per week. Yeah, so it caps out at 24 times 7. That's where you run out of hours for the week because actually you've used the entire week. Somehow you stayed awake for seven days and studied the whole time. And if you believe that, I have a bridge to sell you. And that's where if you go back and you do a horizontal box plot, then it's right and left. And that actually just makes sense. We don't know. This is just a simple example. But if you were doing an experimental design and you wanted to run an experiment or an observational study on students, what would you do to break your students up to prevent that from biasing your results? No, we talked about it today. What would you do? You'd block them. Block them on their area of study. Because everybody knows that art students don't study. Ha, 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 ha. So you'd block on field of study. My undergrad was in engineering. I had 36 hours a week of class, plus homework and stuff. So automatically, I did more work than most of my friends in arts, because they had 15 hours a week of class, plus homework and stuff. 
So you'd block it, right? You'd block it on your area of study or the school you're within if, you're, if your university breaks it down that way. So the school of engineering, the school of nursing, the school of arts, the school of science, the school of commerce, whatever it is, you'd block on that and then you'd randomize in whatever way you wanted to within your study. So yes, it's an important thing to think about. All right, let's just keep going. We're, uh, we're running out of time. Extreme observations. So again, mean, median, standard deviation, and IQR. How would these things be affected if the largest value in the set were taken out of the set and replaced by $10 million? So we have here annual household incomes for a bunch of families. You can see the right skew. What would happen if I took that far right sample, pulled it out, and replaced it with $10 million? What would happen to the mean in that case? Stop and think about the formula for the mean. Did you, did you internalize it? The mean is adding everything up and dividing by n. So if I did this, I'm going to take my sum, and I'm going to remove $1 million from the sum, and replace it by $10 million. So the sum is now bigger. And we divide by the same number. Nothing else changes. So the mean is going to grow with that $10 million new outlier. Standard deviation. Well, the mean's going up, but then you've also got a really big standard deviation for this point that lives all the way over here. So that one is also going to blow up. What about the IQR? Well, let's see. So here's the scenario. So we take the original data. Uh, the original data, annual household income, the median was $190,000 per year. The mean was $245,000 per year. When we add the largest one, and we go from 1 million to 10 million, the median does not change at all. It stays at 190 because they're still 50% below and 50% above. And that one point that was up there at a million is still above, but now it's at 10 million. Median doesn't care. The mean, on the other hand, goes from 245 to 309,000. It gets inflated. It gets dragged. So this is what happens with the mean. Outliers drag the mean toward themselves. Whether they're left outliers or right outliers, they pull at the mean. They are like a really, really, really long seesaw with a kid sitting on the end all the way over there and a really short seesaw over here, with, and you, you need more weight here. And so when you add weight way out there, it pulls the center of the seesaw over, pulls the mean over. If you took the smallest sample, this person here who made zero dollars or you know, very, very little dollars in annual household income, and you gave them $10 million a year, now you're taking a point from the left side of the distribution and you're flipping it over to the right side of the distribution, so the median will slide a very small amount, and we see that, in fact, the median goes from 190 up to $200,000 per year. The mean, on the other hand, gets inflated even more because you just added a full $10 million to the sum and it goes up to 316. The word for this in statistics that we use is we say that the median is robust. That means it's resistant. It resists being pulled around by outliers, and so it is robust. It is a robust estimator. The mean is decidedly not a robust estimator, and neither is the standard deviation. The IQR is also robust. So, if you are using data which you suspect may have outliers, whether they are valid outliers or not, you are better off using robust estimators like the median and the IQR to present your data than the mean and the standard deviation because they will resist contamination from the outliers in a much stronger way. And when you hit real data, it's always good to compare the two and see how similar they are. So this just says the same thing. If you know it is symmetric, you're sure it's symmetric, then the mean and the standard deviation are fine. If it's skewed, though, the median is a, is a better and more helpful way to present the center of your data. So here is an example of what happens with this skew. So if the distribution is skewed, so here's a right skew here and a left skew there, the dashed line is the mean, and the green solid line, if you can see the colors, is the median. With a right skew, the skew pulls the mean up higher than the median. With the left skew, the skew pulls the mean down lower than the median. So the general rule is 
if you compute the mean and the median without knowing anything else about the data, if the mean is bigger than the median, then there is a right skew. If the mean is smaller than the median, then there is a left skew because the skew pulls the mean in one direction or another. If they are the same, then we have this picture over here on the right, and it's approximately a symmetric distribution. You can use this as a diagnostic tool. If you compute these two things, you can then talk about the skew. And I don't know if there's a question on this assignment about that, but I'll try and make sure there's one on the next one so you can practice that idea. All right. Uh, given that this is the percentage of class time that all of you have just spent taking notes versus actually checking Facebook, because those laptops are open and it's so, so tempting, what is most likely true? Is the mean greater than the median, less than the median, equal to the median, or you can't actually tell? What kind of skew is there here? Left skew. What does it do to the mean? Pulls it down. We expect, therefore, that the mean is less than the median. The mean of this is 80%, the median is 76. And if you manage to hit 80% of this class spent taking notes and not sleeping, I'm perfectly happy with that. It's more than you normally get. So uh, just a kind of a note, we will come back to this. Uh, for those of you who are in the full sequence, 1051, 1052, you will absolutely use this again next semester. That's when it really starts to kick in. But if your data is particularly skewed, like really aggressively skewed, like number of basketball games, just hang on. Just wait till the end of class. It's like three minutes. It's hard to analyze that data. And so we use a transformation on that data, the logarithm, which helps compress it a little bit so we can actually see how it is laid out. When we learn about regression in the winter term, this will come up again. You have five minutes. Set your butts down. Pros and cons. Pros, the outliers don't become so outliery. Cons, you mess with the units and it's harder to analyze. We won't do this very often, but I just wanted to introduce it now simply because it's a good chance with the skew argument. So what variables would you expect to be extremely skewed? Salary is extremely skewed. Some people make a lot of money. Ability to throw a football is extremely skewed. There's just really not very many people who can throw a football very well, and the ones who can tend to play football. The rest of us watch football. Housing prices are extremely skewed, again, from the argument that you know, there is a limited number of houses, limited amount of housing stock and land, and people are willing to pay insane amounts of money simply because they have the money, and why not? I mean, if I made $10 million a year, I'd totally own a $6 million cottage. Why not? I can. You know, I make all that money. Let me spend it on something. You, know, you can't take it with you. So variables would be extremely skewed. Uh, what do you see... In this map, we're just talking about intensity map, just to introduce that, that this exists. This is a map of the United States with the change in population in a given county from the year 2000 to the present. And if it's a dark blue color, it's a 10 or a 20% increase. And if it's a yellow or a dark orangey yellow color, it's a 10 to 20% decline in population. What do you see on this? Any patterns? Yep. So coastlines are getting dark blue. Center, Midwest, getting a little more orange. Absolutely. Anything else? You'd have to know a bit about US geography, maybe. Urban areas. You see this. It doesn't matter what the state is. Even in North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, that are losing people, there's little blotches of blue. Those are the cities. Those are the capital cities and the bigger cities of there. If you know where to find stuff, you can find New York City on there. You can find LA. You can find the San Francisco Valley. You can find cities in Utah. Salt Lake has grown tremendously. So what is happening? I'm not sure you can assign that to technology, but yes, America is urbanizing. You're thinking STEM fields. There is some of that. There's less people required to, to produce the same amount of crops because of technology. That is something that's happening there. Yes? That's really what it is. It's economics. 
If you don't have any jobs in the county you grew up in and you stay, then you are unemployed. And that's not fun. So people move to the cities for jobs. There's one fundamental problem with this map. Does anybody think of it? This is a 17 year span. What normally happens across 17 years anyway? Population increases because the replacement birth rate in the United States exceeds 2%, which means in general, the United States is growing at about 2% per year per year, which means across 17 years, you would expect to see at least 34% growth in any given area, nothing else changing. So if you see a place that's minus 20%, not only did it not grow, it shrunk. It's even more aggressive than it seems. The dark blue is the only normal stuff on the map. And that's actually the interesting point about that map. All right, we'll finish up these slides next day. Thank you. Have a good day.